This problem might be a little confusing in the way it's set up, so the first thing I'm going to do is try and reiterate what's going on with the problem, just to hopefully clear up any confusion that you might have. We have two charged particles here at some distance L away from each other. They're fixed in place. Uh, the positive one, One's positive and one's negative, so as we know from our conventions for electric field, the positive one will have the electric field lines pointed away from the charge, and by the same convention, the negative charge will have the electric field lines pointing inward towards the particle. Now, since both of these particles are setting up an electric field, that means that at any given point, there is going to be a net electric field due to the combined effects of both of the particle's fields. This graph on the right here shows the x component of that net electric field, depending on where we are on the x-axis, uh, at least positively, since the axis starts at zero and ends at x sub s, uh, which the problem gives us. It tells us the axis scale is set so that the maximum here is 30 centimeters. Now, intuitively, the shape of this graph should sort of make sense. Notice that at really, really low values of x, especially close to zero, the graph is very, very far negative. This makes sense since if we are on the positive x-axis but close to zero, close to the y-axis, we are very close to the negatively charged particle, meaning that the electric field will be pointing most strongly towards the left due to the inward effect of negative charges fields. As we move further and further away from the two particles, further and further to the right, we can see that the electric field increases. That's because the positively charged particle is much larger it has a much larger magnitude of charge than the negatively charged particle, as the problem tells us. That means that the electric field produced by charge 1, Q1, is going to be much stronger than Q2 at larger distances. Anyways, the problem itself is asking us for the value of x at which the net electric field is at its maximum. If we look at the graph, we can see the field start to rise towards uh, x sub s, but the graph is incomplete, so we can't tell exactly where the, where the electric field hits its maximum. First, let's just set up a formula for the net electric field in the x-direction. First of all, let's recall that the electric field is a vector that follows the principle of superposition, so the net electric field will be equal to the sum of the effects of the electric field due to Q1 and the electric field due to Q2. So I will use E1 to represent the electric field due to Q1, and E2 to represent the electric field of Q2. Right now, this equation isn't super helpful, though, so let's expand this out a bit and rewrite them in the more advanced, uh, in the more advanced versions of the formulas for electric field. Remember, the formula for the electric field due to a charged particle is equal to K, the Coulomb constant, multiplied by the charge divided by the distance squared, the distance meaning the distance between the particle and wherever we are at right now. This distance is going to be a variable, since that's the variable on the graph, is x. So for E1, I can rewrite that term as k, the Coulomb constant, multiplied by the absolute value of q1, the magnitude of the charge, and then I'm going to divide that by the square of the distance between q1 and whatever point we're looking at. Now because q1 is situated not at the origin, but at a distance L away from the origin, this distance will have to be written as L plus X. So X is the changing variable that changes as we move along the axis, and then we're adding L to it since it's going to be that additional distance away. E2 we're going to rewrite in the same way, though it's going to be a little simpler since Q2 is at the origin, so we won't need to add L to it or anything like that. However, the other thing you'll need to keep in mind for Q2 is that because it's negative, its, its field is going to be pointing in the opposite direction as the field produced by E1. So I'll say minus, and then I'll rewrite it the same way, Q times the absolute value, or K times the absolute value of Q2, divided by X squared. Right now this formula is looking pretty good, but there's another small change we can make to it that will make it even more useful. Note that the problem specifies that the ratio of Q1 to Q2, their charge magnitudes, is 4. That means that Q1 has a magnitude of charge 4 times greater than Q2. 
Therefore, if we want to have fewer variables in this equation, we can rewrite q1 as 4 times q2. This will make it simpler for us in the future in case we need to cancel things out, since we're not given the actual magnitudes of the charges in the problem, at least not until part b. Now before we go any further with solving for part a, there's one other thing I think we should do first that would make it very helpful in the future. At some point, we're going to need to find the value of L, the actual distance between the two particles. Now one way to find it that I think would be pretty simple would be to solve this equation that we've just created for L by canceling out some of the other variables and, and taking a known. So for example, the graph clearly tells us that the electric field is at a magnitude of zero once the graph, once the x value, is at this point on the axis. Since the problem tells us that x sub s is 30 centimeters, we can use the scale from this to figure out that this point must be x equals 20 centimeters. Because if we're starting at zero, and we've got three ticks to 30, then it must be that each tick represents 10 centimeters of difference. So yeah, so when x equals 20 centimeters, the electric field, E net, equals zero. If we use both of these facts, then L is the only unknown remaining in the equation for that case. So yeah, so let's set that equation to zero real quick. To solve for L, the first thing we'll want to do is bring um, this, bring one side of the equation to the other. So let's add kq2 over x squared to both sides of the equation. All right, like so. Now some things can get canceled out pretty easily. We've got a q2 on both sides of the equation, so it's a good thing I did that, because now they can cancel out pretty easily enough. The k's will also cancel out for the same reason. Now we want to get the l in the numerator somehow, so let's multiply both sides of this equation by l plus x squared. And by the, for the same reason, let's also multiply both sides of the equation by x squared. That way we'll get all the squares in the top which will make the next step much easier. So multiplying 4 by x squared, we get 4x squared on the left, and then multiplying l, x squared, uh, l plus x squared and bringing that to the top, we just get that on its own on the right. Now let's get rid of the squared terms by taking the square root of both sides. And now to solve for l, we just uh, subtract x from both sides, and l will be completely on its own, meaning that l is going to be equal to x here. Since we were just discussing the case in which the net electric field is equal to zero, that has to happen when x equals 20 centimeters. So that means that the length, the, that L, the distance between the two particles, is equal to 20 centimeters. So we'll have to keep this in mind for later. All right, now let's actually begin solving for the first part of the problem, part A. Now remember, part A is asking for the value of x at which the electric field, the net electric field, is at its maximum. So we're trying to maximize this function here, which will require some calculus. When we want to try to maximize a function, we want to take its derivative, the derivative of that function, and then solve that for zero and find the value for that. So the first step we'll want to take is find the derivative of e sub net with respect to x, since that's our changing variable here. Now this derivative might look obnoxious to solve, but it's actually a lot simpler than it looks. Uh, it, it just looks messy because of all the constants and variables at the top. But keep in mind that since we're differentiating with respect to x, most of them can just be, for the most part, ignored. This is actually a relatively straightforward example of the denominator power rule where all we actually have to do is raise the denominator, raise the exponent of the denominator by one, and then multiply that denominator by the numerator. So in the first term, for example, all we need to do is change this two in the denominator to a three, and then multiply the numerator of that term by two. So this four will just become an eight, really. In the denominator version of the power rule, the whole term also becomes negative. The signs flip, anyway. So this is all we need to do, at least for the first term. Uh, the second term, once again, the signs flip, so it's going to become positive rather than negative. And then it's just going to be x cubed in the denominator. And then 2kq2 in the numerator. 
Now remember, since we're maximizing the function, we have to set this whole thing equal to zero. And now we just gotta solve for x. So first off, let's move this negative term to the right side of the equation so that it can become positive. Now as usual, some of these variables can cancel out. The q2s will cancel out, and so will the k's. And since we've got a 2 in the numerator on one side, and an 8 in the other, we can also make those numbers a bit smaller by dividing them both by 2. So the 2 here becomes a 1, and the 8 here becomes a 4. Now once again, let's bring these cube terms into the top via cross multiplication. Now let's take the cubed root of both sides to get the cubed side of the way. This time it's a little more messy looking because 4 doesn't have a, a simple cube on its own. So we'll just keep so for the time being I'll just keep writing it as the cubed root of 4 since turning it into decimals would make it even less clean. Anyways, we're still trying to solve for x here. So let's subtract both sides of the equation by x to get both both all the x's on its own on a single side of the equation. Now we can turn these two x's into one single term by factoring it out into parentheses. So now we've got x times, in parentheses, the cube root of 4 minus 1 equals L. Now to get, L, to get x on its own, the final thing we have to do is divide both sides of the equation by the cube root of 4 minus 1. And that's it for part A. This is, the final, this is the final equation we'll need to use. So all that's left is to plug in the value found for L and into your calculator, the whole equation into your calculator. And if done correctly, you should find an x value of 34 centimeters. Compared to part A, part B is very straightforward. Part B just gives us a value of charge for Q2 and asks us to find the value of the electric field at that maximum. Remember, way at the beginning when we first started solving this problem, we found this equation right here for the electric field, for the net electric field. So all we have to do is just plug in the value that they give us for Q2 Use 34 centimeters for x, or whatever your calculator gave you. It, probably some decimal thing that can be rounded to 34 centimeters, but it'd be, be it'd be more accurate to use the full version that your calculator gives you. And then, of course, 20 centimeters for L. Oh, and remember that E refers to the elementary charge. So just use 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs for that. Either way, if done correctly and put in your calculator, then you should get an electric field at that point of about 2.2 times 10 to the negative 8 newtons per coulomb. And that is the solution to these problems. I hope this video helped you. If you have any further questions, you are more than welcome to leave a comment below asking for clarification on anything. And of course, if you have a request for a future video that you'd like me to make, uh, like a problem you'd like me to go over, then you may also comment that, or you may join my Discord server, link in the channel description, to ask me about it directly or to speak to me directly. Have a lovely day. Bye-bye.